Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Canada C3 Hangout. My name is Joe Grabowski. I'll be your host for today. For those maybe new to the Canada C3, uh, it's a signature project for Canada's 150th anniversary, and the centerpiece is an epic 150-day sailing journey from Toronto to Victoria via the Northwest Passage that's connected Canadians from coast to coast and inspired a deeper understanding of our land, our peoples, and the past, present, and future of Canada. The expedition is divided into 15 legs and had a cross-section of Canadians on board, including scientists, artists, Indigenous elders, historians, community leaders, youth, journalists, and educators. And from hosting many of these hangouts, we're up into the 20s now, I can vouch for the amazing, amazing people who have been on board the vessel, from musicians to the scientists uh, to the educators and the youth leaders. It's just been an incredible journey. And today, I'm very excited to be joined by Diz uh, Glithero. She's uh, the education team lead on Canada C3. She's an environmental educator, a youth advocate, and a community in innovator. She's experienced over 15 polar expeditions and won many awards. And she's been on C3 for many legs of the journey so far. And Diz, you'll remember we kicked things off, oh, it would have been last April with a little kind of introduction hangout to the Canada C3. And a lot has happened since then. Good morning, everyone. It is so great to join you guys today. And thanks so much for your interest to be involved. And thanks, Joe, for hosting today. It is day 148 of our 150-day journey. So it's hard to believe that we are into the final two days. And I noticed there's a... Hey, raise your hands if you're the class from Picton, Ontario. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> oh, there they are. Great. That was our very first stop. We started in Toronto on June 1st, and on June 2nd, we pulled into Picton. So it feels pretty neat to come full circle with you guys this morning. But it has, like Joe said, it's been an epic uh, last 148 days. It's been five months at sea, and it's been an incredible journey. We've had over 400 different Canadians on board, and the goal was to get as diverse of a group of Canadians on board as possible. So that as we travel around the coastline of Canada, we would be able to have conversations with one another that often you don't get a chance to have, to make connections between people that you, you don't meet, um, maybe in the community that you live or the, the region you're from. And our whole journey was built around four main themes. So we looked a lot around the environment, we talked a lot about reconciliation and the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians. We talked a lot about diversity and inclusion. And we also talked a lot about youth engagement. And it was neat, on every leg of the journey, we made sure we had at least two or three young Canadians between 18 and 25 on board with us. Right now, we've got our final three youth ambassadors, and they bring a huge piece and vision and energy to this whole project. So that's been really special. And in a few minutes, we're going to be joined by the captain of the ship because Stefan Guy, the captain, he's one of only two people out of all 400 the entire journey. He was set sail on June 1st, and he hasn't gotten off the ship yet. So he's got a pretty neat perspective to share. I've been on uh, leg two, leg three, leg eight, leg 13, and now leg 15. So I've, I've seen quite a bit. Um, and I just want to share a couple stories with you, and then the captain's going to share a few things. And then I'd love to take as many questions as we can, because today's the last hangout we're having with schools. And just so you know, you're now part of a group of over 50,000 kids from across the country that we've had direct hangouts with or live learning events. So that's pretty special, and we're thrilled that you're a part of it. So a couple of things that struck me is that we... You know, heading into it, you didn't, you knew it was going to be special. You knew that as we sailed Canada, which is the largest coastline of any country in the world. Did you guys know that? Canada is the second largest country in terms of land mass, but we have the longest coastline of any country in the world. And if you were to go around the entire coastline and circle, navigate around all the islands that make up Canada, it would be over 240,000 kilometers long. But if you just hug the coastline like we've done, um, it, we've traveled over 23,000 kilometers. And we knew it was going to be special and we'd, we'd see a lot of great things and meet a lot of interesting people. But what's really struck me is that every single community we've been into, and there's been 75 communities so far, 
Over 40 of them have been Indigenous, either First Nation or Inuit, and some of them as small as 60 people living in them, 150 people. And it's just, it's profound how extraordinary every community is in this country. You, we were blown away by um, the strong sense of community everywhere we went, the people we met, the pride they had for their communities, uh, a lot of really success stories and innovations happening in these communities despite how remote some of them are. So that's been extraordinary. I think the other thing that really struck me is that go along the Arctic coastline and then down the BC coastline is the the incredible sense of generational stewardship. You know, generation after generation after generation, there has been such stewardship and conservation of the land. And when you get a chance to spend time in those communities and meet the people and from youth right up to elders and then each of them talking about the elders who've become before them. And it's been pretty neat to see that there's just been such a, such a respect and um, um, protect so much of the wilderness uh, and wild places that make up East Canada so unique and how grateful we are. I think I've been someone who's always loved the outdoors and loved the natural world, but to be on this journey, to see it, to see so much of the country and then to meet the people who've been largely the, the protectors of this uh, and caretakers of the land has been quite profound. And look who's just joined me there, guys. Here's Captain Stefan Guy. Nice. So hi, everybody. Here, uh, let me turn the mics on really quick so they can say hi. Here, guys, microphones are on. <laughs> right on. So, Stefan, we've just been talking a little bit about the project and some of the things that have struck me along the way, but they, I just shared with them, you're one of only two people out of 400 or so. Three? Three. three. Who's the third? Uh, myself. Yeah. Uh, there's my second, Jim Pierce, Chief Officer, and Scott McDougall. Scott McDougall. So three hardcore sailors. All right. So maybe, Stefan, you can share what's, you know, for being one of only three, you've been on the journey the entire time. What stood out for you? What struck you? Uh, the positive energy. This, this might sound strange, but you know when... You guys, when you're happy with the day, how the day goes well? Well, me, I was happy for 150 days along that trip. So this is how good this trip is. It was not easy. But the crew was fantastic, and I was happy for 150 days. Do you understand what it means, 150 days? Just to give you an idea, between one birthday to another, there are over 300 days, okay? From one birthday of yours to the next one, 300 days. I spend 150 days, and some of us as well, that's a lot of days at sea. It's like half a birthday. Mm. Was there a special moment that, if you had to pick one or two moments that stood out or days that stood out the most, which ones might they be? Uh, there were many, but I like to think of the challenge of completing the Northwest Passage. There's this little place up in the Arctic where there is a lot of ice, and always since we have came here as sailors in the Arctic, this place was very problematic, and we succeeded in completing this passage. Of course, we had a good vessel, and I hope a good captain. So we succeeded, and that's a little bit of my highlight. I, I'm really happy with that. Great. And one, I have one question I asked the captain this morning, and I asked if he'd look it up for us to share. Is I was curious, because I don't know yet, how much fuel did we burn to do this journey? We, we had a, a lot of fuel. This is not cheap. It's over 500 cubic meters. One cubic meter, is, to give you an idea, is a liter. Oh, boy. You know what is a liter? A liter of milk? Maybe you all know about that, or a liter of juice. You all have that in the morning on the, the table. But for each cubic meters, there's a thousand of these. 
and then there was mm -hmm. 5,000 cubic meters. 500. 500. Over 500. Wow. So that's a lot of fuel. Saying that, it might sound strange at the same time saying that this ship has sailed all from coast to coast to coast, paying attention to how much fuel we burn. Why? Well, because it's very expensive, but also we had great concern about the environment. So this is not a, no, a new ship, it's an old one with old technology, but we managed to burn fuel in a very, very efficient way to protect the environment. That's great. And because it is, I mean, the environment's one of our main themes is we wanted to ensure that we, we are aware that we are going to have a big ecological footprint. And I know you guys in school, you probably learn about our ecological footprints and how do we minimize those as good global citizens. And we were aware that the footprint of this expedition, because we're on a big Coast Guard vessel, would burn a lot of fuel. And now we know it, it was a lot of fuel. And that one of our partners is called Bullfrog Energy. And so fuel we consumed along the way, we bought carbon offsets to to help um, yeah offset the the amount we burned and to ensure that you know we take responsibility for that and and that I wanted to bring that up because I think it's one of the important learning through this is that there's times where you need to to have a footprint in order to create opportunities that will lead to bigger and more sustained change and I think the whole goal of the Canada C3 journey is that if we have the opportunity to connect Canadians right across the country and share our stories and to build a better understanding of one another and relationships with one another, we could start to work better in terms of looking at where we need to make change in our society and how we go about doing that and how do we connect the dots between all these communities who are trying to do things so that we can lead to bigger change in Canada. And so we feel that despite the fuel we've consumed and the footprint we May it's my network. You're a part of what Canada C3 is all about. So, so that's great. I'm going to share one more thing, and then I'd like to open it up to questions because today we want to take as many questions as possible. The one thing we I want to share also is that we were aware going into this journey that not all can Canadians are celebrating or wanting to celebrate Canada 150. Um, and even though this is a signature project and it is a 150 day journey to to recognize. Canada's 150th. For us, it was more of an opportunity to create the space to have some of those conversations that are creating some of the tensions around it. And there's many First Nation and Indigenous Canadians who, who, who weren't excited about Canada 150, who didn't want to celebrate it. And the past 150 years have not, have not been good for them and for, for us collectively as a country. Um, sometimes we haven't learned a lot about residential schools or the 60s scoop or relocations, but as this journey's gone along, we have heard stories after stories in all these communities along the way, and it's built a much bigger understanding. And I think it's built a lot more trust and, and, and collaboration, and that's what we'll use to go forward. So it's been a pretty, pretty special part. It's also been a pretty emotional spot. There's, uh, there's been a lot of tears on the ship for sure, and a lot of people sharing and opening up and that's made it pretty special. And before uh, before I go, Jason, our food manager, he heard that this was the last um, hangout with students, so he just emailed a few funny numbers to share with you guys. In 148 days so far, everyone, on, but we've consumed 18,000 eggs. And he said over the last 148 days, we've used up 1,500 pounds of butter, 4,500 apples, and 5,000 pounds of seafood. So we did. We definitely didn't go hungry on this <laughs> vessel, but it's pretty fun to kind of look at it now and think, my gosh, we've traveled a long way. We've sure learned a lot. But here we go. So let's open it up, Joe, to a lot of questions and, and hear what you guys like to ask. All right. Well, thank you, both of you, for sharing some of your favorite moments from the C3. And, uh, you know, I'm glad you shared those food statistics because from Hangout 1 to today, the common theme has been that the food on board has been incredible. So it's nice to hear some of those statistics. 18,000 eggs, wow, that's impressive. 
Stefan alone ate 300. He had two <laughs> eggs every day for 150 days. So there you go. He did his part. <laughs> A little Canada C3 map or math. Uh, before we do jump to some questions, do you mind just turning the camera so we can see where you are today? For yeah. sure. So we are in a special place called Salt Spring Island. And tell me there, Joe, if you guys can see out here. We got and it. And it's yeah. part of the Gulf Islands, which is located between Vancouver and Vancouver Island. It's an island here, a community. I'm not actually sure. I haven't been out yet to see how many people live here. I'm thinking it's around. I was told 6,000. 6,000 people here on the island. Beautiful. We've lucked out. I'll just walk you around to the other side here so you can see. Tied up about an hour ago. We came in and tied up to the dock here. You can see here, and we've got, looking out, it's just an incredible place. When we were coming in this morning, we had two humpback whales. Uh, there's a couple pods of orcas that have been spotted recently. And in about an hour, we're heading up to speak at the high school here, so that'll be fun. And then we're off to an organic farm and permaculture center this afternoon to learn about um, kind of food life here on the island. So, yeah, pretty pretty special spot. All right. Sounds like you've got a great day ahead of you, and I'm sure as the community wakes up, they're going to make their way down to check out the C3. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's meet some classrooms. So let's start off. Let's see. Let's go to our grade two classroom first. So Mrs. Lombardo, if you can turn your microphone on for me. It's a grade two class in Calgary, Alberta. And you can go ahead with a couple questions. Go ahead, Sophia. What type of sea animals do we see? You might have to yell. What type of sea animals do we see? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's a great question. Well, I'll share, um, my highlight from leg 13, which was the top part of the BC coast from Prince Rupert down to Bella Bella. We had two humpback whales one afternoon and we were out in the kayaks and on the paddle boards and they started breaching in front of us, which means when the whale jumps right out of the water. And humpback whales are over 65, 70 feet long and so they were coming right out of the water, two of them. And they must have done these acrobatics for at least 15 minutes or so. We had a private show in Haida Gwaii. It was pretty special. And one of the moments uh, that was interesting too is that you'd, you'd see them jump and you'd see them land, but it was about 30 seconds later that you'd hear the, the echo and the boom of the sound when they hit the water. It kind of reverberated around the land. So that was pretty neat. We've seen, do you want to list them off? Bear, polar bear. We've seen polar bears. Walruses. Walrus. Seals. Seal. Sea lion. Sea lions. Bald eagle. Yep. Spirit bear. Spirit bears. Grizzlies. Black bear. Um, dolphins of all kinds. I yep. don't know their specific names. We had a sighting of a bowhead whale that only a few people saw. Um, minky whales. Orcas. Orcas. Um, that. And those are a lot of the larger creatures, but you know, we've also had a big science program on board and they've been doing every day taking water samples and doing plankton toes and they're catching every day a lot of microscopic creatures. So we've got, you know, phytoplankton and krill, um, lots of jellyfish, CNMs, just a whole bunch of stuff. So it's been pretty neat. And one of the science projects, and as soon as the scientists, once this expedition is done, has a chance to put those all together and kind of put it into a way that's, makes the findings accessible for students and they've created a, a, a biodiversity footprint of every living thing found in the water for all 150 days and so we'll be sharing that with classrooms over the coming months all right lots of animals and before we get the next question from the grade twos in calgary i think because this is our last hangout every time we get to a new classroom i think they should be loud and cheer a little bit so i want to hear the grade twos uh, this morning. How is everybody? Oh, a little louder than that. That's better. Let's steal another question. Why did you have to do this journey? Hmm. Why? Why is always a great question. I think we felt that there's a lot of different ways why or how 
Canadians chose or wanted to celebrate. And at, we, there's a group of us who had done a lot of expeditions before with high school students. And we do them every summer up in the Arctic. And we know that a ship-based journey, traveling through wild parts of the, um, the country of Canada, really creates a, a rich learning environment. And so we thought, why not do that? with a bunch of Canadians from all over the country together over 150 days. And I really, when it comes down to it, it's simply a chance for us to share experiences that will help us build a better understanding and a better relationship with each other. Because I think once you have that, then you start to work together better. It's just like you guys at the start of the year, you come together, you're a bit nervous at the start of the year, you don't maybe know each other. And then you work together with your teacher, you create this special learning community with which you ask questions and you do neat learning experiences and go out on field trips and I mean this was in many ways kind of a giant a giant field trip a giant learning experience for Canada and through that we learned a lot and not all of it was easy but a lot of it was beautiful and together it's profound in terms of where it could take us as a country all right, thank you so much for those what great questions, you? grade twos. If you don't mind, if you haven't already, muting the microphone for me, that would be awesome. And let's meet our next classroom. So this time, let's go to Picton, Ontario, where the first stop of the Canada C3 was. We've got a grade three, four class with Mrs. Carroll, and I'll turn your microphone on. Say hi. Hi. Okay, more like a turn. Hello, Picton. How are you guys? <laughs> what question would you like to ask? Why did um, you guys choose an icebreaker? So why did you choose an icebreaker? Uh, that's a that's a good and interesting question. You know, our voyage took us from the Atlantic coast to the Arctic and then the Pacific coast. But one of these coasts is quite difficult to sail. It's in the Arctic. And what do we have in the Arctic? Lots of it. Ice. And to uh, sail through ice fields, what kind of ship do you need? An icebreaker. So the, cho the choice of this vessel was quite a logical one, an easy one to make. So we look for an icebreaker. And not only is it an icebreaker, but it's also a large icebreaker, so we can take a lot of people with us. So that's the main reason why we choose these, this icebreaker. And one more thing, do you know where this icebreaker comes from? Well, this was built in Canada and used to be in the Canadian Coast Guard and most of its life served as an icebreaker for the Canadian Coast Guard. We have borrowed this ship to make this journey and it proved to be a very good icebreaker. And what the captain taught a lot of us on board is a lot of people think icebreakers plow their way through the ice, but what this icebreaker does, the bow of the ship, the front of the ships, is reinforced with a lot of steel. But what it does is it comes along, it comes up onto the ice and then crashes down and comes up and crashes down and that allows it to break through the ice as we go along. So even though for the Atlantic and the Pacific we didn't need an icebreaker, for the Arctic coast we did and that's why we chose this ship. And it's been pretty special. All right, I can attest to that. I got a tour in Toronto and it's a really cool ship. And if you take some time to look at a picture of the ship, if you haven't already, there's a big, looks like a big white golf ball sitting on top. And that's pretty special, that dish. Um, inside let, let you guys trans or broadcast from pretty much anywhere you didn't need internet you didn't need cell phone connection we could do these video connections um through that satellite technology so that's pretty cool can you uh, in, go this? ahead if you have another question oh sorry go ahead can you all see this let's go really quick yeah it's a big round chunk of steel this is how thick is the plating of the hull? This is the skin of the ship. It's very thick, it's that thick. And why is that? Well, the ship needs to be very strong in order to sail into ice. So this is the thickness of the, the, the ship's hull. 
All right, very cool. Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, Mrs. Carol's class uh, from Picton, they blinked in, but I think they're back. Are you guys back, Mrs. Carol's class? All right, well, we'll swing back. To, oh, there they are. Can you hear me, Picton? Yeah, I think you have your microphone on mute. Can you unmute it for me? Yes! There we go. We want to make sure you get your second question in. Okay, Carl, ask your question. Was it scary on the ship at the times when the water when the water was really wavy? Scary? Well, if you ask me, no, it was not scary. I think there were some days when the sea was a little bit difficult, you know, lots of wave. Some people were concerned, you know. I wouldn't be I wouldn't say scared, but you know sail at sea and sometimes the sea can be pretty rough. So we had a couple of days people were concerned, but more than that, uh, do you know that when a ship moves a lot at sea, you get discomfort? We call that seasickness. So seasickness was more of a problem for our people on the ship used to sail, and this was more of a problem than being scared of the sea. I will not explain you why this is happening, but very often on a ship, when it moves a little bit too much, people get sick. Some others don't. It was the difficult bit we had to face on the ship and try to take care of our, our colleagues and friends who were not feeling so good. Two probably roughest days. One was off the coast of Labrador. And when you see the bow of the ship here and you can look down to where those black zodiacs are with the kayaks on the top, there was water pouring right across over the sides of the, the bow there. So that was a pretty, pretty rough day. And the other one was coming around Alaska, leaving the Western Arctic and coming around Alaska. So there was definitely a few days uh, that many participants didn't eat much. <laughs> All right. Great questions, Picton. Thanks so much. Let's jump over. Let's visit. We've got a homeschool group joining us from Surrey, B.C., um, let me turn on your mic and you guys can go ahead with a question. So it should be on now. Can you say hi? Anya, say hi. Hi. If you want to ask a question. Hey there. Um, How are you? Good. At night, would you stop in one place or would you keep going? At night, did we stop or did we keep going? Actually, we stopped almost every day in a new location, almost every day. So we sailed at night, sometimes at day, but every day the ship stopped in order to do exploration or to meet with the communities. And that was the purpose of this trip. So it was a long trip, but we took our time to do it. Every day we stopped, we put the zodiacs in the water, and we went ashore to do science, explore, or meet with people. And that was the purpose of this trip, to make friends and to show people what is Canada about. So every day we stop. And when we were in more of the remote places, like up in the Arctic, we would be out on the land or in communities during the day, and then it was always sailing at night to position the ship so that we'd wake up in the next spot we wanted to be. But when we're in places like right now, in more of the populated areas and down in Vancouver, Victoria area, we will stay at anchor for the night. And the ship, like this morning, for example, we heard the anchor being pulled up at around 5.30 in the morning, which is a low grumbling kind of sound hearing it. And then it was a short distance sail to where we needed to get to this morning. So it just depends where we were. All right. Great question. Thank you, uh, Surrey, BC. Let's jump over to... Um, Blenheim, Ontario. We have Mrs. Uh, Bondi Heron's group. They're a grade four or five classroom. And let me turn your mic on for you. How's everyone doing over there? Good. Hey, guys. Hi. 
I have Danielle here, and she has a question for you. Yeah. Does she need to be a little closer? I think I heard what was the favorite place we've been to on the whole journey. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, John, do you want you to go first, and then me? Yeah. Well, that is a very difficult question. You know that because we've been to so many nice places. Not nice very nice places that is very difficult to answer this question and i think it is unfair to say which place is the best you know why because we've met people in so many great places and i think this is maybe not the answer you expect from me but i think it was great all across canada but again, me as captain, I really, really, really enjoy the Arctic. Okay, very much the Arctic. But the truth, it's not the only best place. Here on BC coast, uh, it's really spectacular. And on this trip, I've discovered more uh, in depth, Newfoundland. Newfoundland was a place I didn't know very well. So for me, it was an, an opportunity to discover Newfoundland and BC. But the true everything was great and worth a visit. And this is the purpose of this trip, to show you about Canada. Yeah, I don't I definitely couldn't say my one favorite. We were in Hartley Bay, which is on the center coast there of BC, between Haida Gwaii and Bella Bella area. And we had the privilege of meeting up with Marvin Robinson, who is a uh, a local Gitgat Nation member and lives in Hartley Bay, it's a community of 150 people. And he took us out for the last 30 years. He's been looking after kind of the protector of the spirit bears on behalf of the nation. And every day he goes out, he knows where they, there's three locations where he knows they are. And he goes out and just watches and makes sure, you know, everything's okay. And, and just that relationship, that connection he has with the bears. So he, he offered to take us out there to one of the spots. And we went out to this place called Gribble Island. And there's what the spirit bear is. A few nods. So the spirit bear is a black bear that has a recessive gene that makes its, its fur white. You know, I think there's about 400 bears that have this recessive gene. And all spirit bears in the world are found in Canada. We're the only country that has them. And to have, like, so when we set out that day with Marvin, you know, we thought if we just saw one sighting of one far off up a river creek, we'd be blown away. Well, for the, for five hours that day, we sat along the shore of a creek bed and we had two spirit bears and a black bear come as close as one meter, like three feet from people. They were, they were sitting in the river, just feeding away on salmon. It was this time of year, the salmon are running upstream, laying their eggs and dying. Um, so the riverbeds are just full of salmon that are on their very last days. And the bears, not even interested that we were there. They were just eating and eating, and they just look up at us. So to have an opportunity like that, to be together with bears that close in their own environment with someone who has 30 years of a relationship with them was truly spectacular. That sounds absolutely amazing. It's incredible. Uh, let's do one more question from Blenheim. Um, let me make sure your microphone's on. There we go. Um, I'm just wondering, did you get an opportunity to see the Northern Lights during your journey? Yes, we had many opportunities. Not only did we have opportunities, but small teams on board were, were, uh, were established in order to wake up people at night in case we came across Northern Lights. And so, one guy would, was designated to call all the others who wanted to come on the bridge and witness the Northern Light. And of course, the opportunity were numerous. And you know, you know Northern Lights, uh, we don't see them very often in Southern Canada, but in the high Arctic, during the time we sailed across the high Arctic, they happen almost every day when the sky was clear. So yes, we experience and, know, and, and witness the Northern Lights very often. All right, thanks for the questions. Let's meet another classroom. So we're jumping to Calgary, Alberta again, and we have 
uh, group of grade fives with Mrs. Stevenson, and it looks like a big group, so I imagine that they're pretty loud. Pretty loud. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if you guys have a question, go ahead. Uh, why were you chosen for the three? Like how? How were people how were chosen? chosen? That's a great question. Yeah, so back in March, we had a public application process. And we put it out to Canadians and anyone 18 and older who is a Canadian citizen could apply. And the main part of the application was to create a two minute video. You know, why you, why would you want to go on this journey? What is it you'd want to learn? What is it you want to contribute and share? What, what's your hopes or visions for Canada? And within two weeks, we had over 5,000 video applications come in. And then we had a selection team, both an internal team as well as an external team from across the country go through those and choose 400 or so people that best fit. And a lot of it was around their responses and, and the reasons why they wanted to come and the ways they wanted to take this opportunity and then afterwards do something with it. But it was also about um, wanting to ensure we really had the most diverse cross-section of Canadians on board. So we, every leg, you know, we, had, we always had a newcomer, someone who's been in Canada for less than 12 months. Uh, we always had, um, you know, French speaking, English speaking, and, and other languages. We had always had at least a third to a half on board who were First Nation, Métis, or Indigenous. And people coming from small rural communities as well as large cities. Um, we had visibly disabled and just all different types of interests and backgrounds. So it made for a really special cross-section every time we changed over to a new light. All right, great question. And we'll grab one more from Calgary. From Calgary. How did you entertain yourself on this evening? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, how do you respond to this morning? I said, there's no downtime. Like every single minute of the day is go, go, go. And so, there, yeah, there was no need to, you know, entertain ourselves per se because there was, there's no downtime. It was either as soon as we arrived, like 7.30 this morning in a community, by 8, 8.30, we are off the ship, greeted by local people. And, and, and they've kind of created what they want us to do for that for the day so it's not a team of c3 staff who decide oh we've arrived in salt spring let's go here here and here we've actually reached out to salt spring island as with all 75 communities almost a year ago and said here's what we're doing here's who's coming and who's on board and what it's all for what is it about salt spring island or picton or any other place we've been that you would like to share with canadians and they create the day for us. And so it's really special because no two days have been the same. Um, and then on that note, the days that we're not visiting communities, because there are some days where we've had sea days and we've just been sailing the whole time. And on those days, then we have, we do some presentations or workshops. So different people who are on board want to share, you know, the work they're doing in their community or the work around reconciliation or inclusion that they're doing. Um, and just a chance to, or action workshops around, you know, things we could do once we're back home. So it's been pretty neat. There's not a lot of downtime. The odd time you'll get people playing music, painting, reading books, uh, fishing, kayaking, paddle boarding. So yeah, a lot of different activities. All right. We're going to jump now to um, Saskatchewan. So we have a class joining us um, in Esteban, Saskatchewan. And it says grade seven on my list, so just confirm that for me. And then we'd love to hear your questions. And it sounds like you might be on an iPhone or iPad, so you'll have to come nice and close so we can hear you. Have you had any problems on your ship? Have we had any problems? Have we had any problems on? Yeah. Is that the question? Okay. Well, with the ship, 
I don't want to say we were lucky. I think we had a very good team who looked at it. And the truth, we didn't have any problem at all with the show. And that's, that's quite an achievement. We had very good engineers on board because, you know, the ship is a very big engine. So they are engineers every day and have any problem. The programming or the experience point of view, almost, there'd definitely be like, or groups of people that, because of the unique makeup of people, sometimes the leg might be more, more intense or more emotional or have stories that are, you know, trigger more um, responses that create you know, the need for to move through it. But those are great opportunities, opportunities for us to come together more, more time to share and understand each other. So certainly no problems, but definitely all 15 legs were different. They, none of them were the same or created the same because every time there was new people, a new uh, combination, new energy. All right, let's steal one more question from Saskatchewan. <laughs> What does, what does the C3 stand for? Can you ask that one more time? What does the C3 stand for? I think they're wondering uh, C3, what does that stand for? Why Canada C3? Yeah, so C, the letter C is for coast to coast to coast. Although by now on day 148, it might be crazy, crazy, crazy. But, uh, <laughs> but it's, it was to stand for the three coastlines that comprise Canada. All right. And I have a quick question for uh, our class in Saskatchewan. I'm from Saskatchewan. Are you guys close to Mooseman? Yes. We're in Estevan. Yeah, is that close to Mooseman? Is it in northern or more southern? Saskatchewan. Okay. All right. So maybe pretty close. Very cool. Let's meet our final class. They are joining us from Guelph, Ontario at Westminster Woods Public School. And it says grade 7, 8. Um, let me turn the microphone on and you guys can confirm that for me. How's Hi. everyone doing? It's a grade 5 class, two grade 5 classes. Perfect. And we are doing great. Hey. Hello, Guelph. Hello. Hi. Okay. <laughs> we have a question. He's coming. Um, have you seen any climate change when you were um, traveling? Any evidence of climate change? Yeah. What a great, great question. Yeah, I mean, definitely. The, the, as we move through the Arctic, you're right in the sense that um, the amount of sea ice and the amount of glacial ice in the Arctic each year is getting less and less. And although we couldn't see that in this journey in the sense that we, you know, we were only 150 days straight through, but Students on Ice, the organization that's behind Canada C3, goes to the Arctic every year. And for the last 12 years that I've been going, Every year when you return to the same places, the glaciers have receded a little bit more, a little bit more, and the beaches are bigger. Um, the amount of, you know, the thousands of cubic meters of ice are just calving off of the glaciers and out into the ocean. And so you can visibly, with your own eye, see year to year the, the changes that are happening. Um, in terms of, you know, this year, some people get confused with, and is for sure there's, uh, you know, the, the amount of sea ice and glacial ice is decreasing each year because of climate change. But you still have the annual ice, well, like just this year's sea ice. And this year turned out to be a heavy ice year. Yeah. There was a lot of ice. And so when Captain was talking about how tricky it was to navigate the ice, and particularly through the narrow Northwest Passage, it was because this year the annual ice was heavy, even though the overall trend consistently is that we're losing a lot of sea ice every year. Do you want to add to that? Or? Yeah, but just to give you an idea, 
I'm not as young as you are, but when I was younger and started to work on ships in the Arctic, it was not an easy voyage, and we couldn't trust the Northwest Passage very easily. It was almost impossible. Now, today, in 2017, we can make that passage. Why is that? Well, we have better knowledge, yes, but overall, the ice concentration, the total amount of ice we found when we sail across the Northwest Passage is far less than before. And this is over only 30 years. For you, it might sound a lot of years, but the truth is, this is within my short life, 30 years for me is small. And within 30 years, uh, we, we notice big changes. And now it is possible not only for an icebreaker to go across the Northwest Passage, but for a small, ordinary vessel. So that tells you a little bit how serious the climate change is really happening. We can see that. The day that Canada C3 went through the Northwest Passage, there was a, a small family sailboat there. And boy, were they excited to see us because they weren't sure if they were gonna make it through because they, they don't have that thick steel hull. And so when they saw us come, they just tucked in behind us and sailed through the Northwest Passage. So we kind of towed them through, so they were pretty happy. But I'll just add, it's a fantastic question. I'm glad you guys asked that. The other way what we learned, how we knew evidence of climate change was happening is that every community we went into in the Arctic, we'd have a chance to share and sit down with elders and hunters or uh, just local people in the community. And they would all talk about how the ice used to be so predictable. They knew when, when they could go out on the ice, they could, by the sound of it, the feel of it, the noises it made, it, the texture of it, they knew it was very predictable and they could always get out to their favorite hunting areas or harvesting areas. But what consistently we heard over and over again is that it's unpredictable. They, they're nervous at times to go out now or the window of time when they're willing to go out on the land is much smaller than it used to be. So those stories are, you know, I would say the most important evidence of climate change, even more than the science. I mean, it's, it's the local people who know the places so well, um, and their stories are consistently saying the same thing. Okay, and it's great that you can bring back some of those stories now, too. That'll be some of the legacy of the Canada C3. The Canada C3. All right, Guelph, Ontario, let's grab another one. What kind of message do you want to leave with us? What kind of message? I have one. You got one? Okay. Do you know this voyage is in intended at youth? Okay, it's one of the theme of this voyage. And myself, I have kids. And I would like very much, since you're all there, to understand that in order to make this a nice, nice world, we must prepare it for you guys to take over. Now, I don't want to put pressure on you, but I feel that it's my duty to tell you that this world is very beautiful. And I want to prepare it for you in order for you to prepare it for the future to make it nice. So in that respect, uh, this is the message I'd like to pass on to all you kids. It's about you and Hope that future is bright, not dark, very bright. And it's, it's for you tomorrow to, to take the important decision to make this happen. And yeah, I'll build on that. And, you know, with Canada having a population of roughly 37 million people, over a third of those people are under the age of 25. And so can, it's, there's, there's a force of young Canadians out there and if young people have the opportunities to get engaged and take leadership roles in their community and to put the ideas of young people into decision making and into community building, I think Canada would be a lot better because I've learned firsthand that young people have some of the most innovative and creative and positive ideas and those are the ideas that we need right now. So that's definitely a message I have. And the other probably big message for me that it hit, hit home for me during this journey was that Regardless of our backgrounds, where we live, who we are, um, you know, our race, religion, you know, ethnicities and backgrounds, what have you, is that 
there's one common thread that connects us all, and that's the earth. We're, we're all connected to the earth. And, and I think to, to come together, not only to collectively protect and be stewards of the earth, but to ensure that as we go forward to build communities that thrive and create conditions for young people to thrive across this country, we have to do it with earth in mind. We have to make sure that the earth is always at the forefront of our decision making. Because without a healthy planet, um, there isn't healthy communities. So it's, it's a relationship in which the human, we are all nested within the earth. And I think that was a big takeaway for me is just to see how different communities are going about that. All right. And I just want to give a quick shout out. There's some classrooms who are already posting some pictures on Twitter uh, of them hanging out with us today. So any of the classrooms watching today, uh, if you took any pictures, please put them up on Twitter with at Canada underscore C3 so we can see uh, your classrooms in action because that's always always lots and lots of fun. So uh, Captain did and Diz, we've had a, a great hangout today and the questions coming in from the students have been absolutely incredible and I think it was really exciting that we had classrooms from all different parts of Canada. It was neat that we had Picton, which was a nice little start to the first stop, and, and our homeschool group from BC, which is where you guys are right now. So that was pretty cool. And I guess the one next thing to think about is the legacy of the Canada C3. And I imagine it's going to take you guys years to unpack everything from the science to the stories to the video to I can only imagine what the next few years are going to be like. Mm, for sure, and that is a big piece. We certainly don't want come Saturday when the ship arrives in Victoria that it that's it, that's the end of C three, and and that it only you know reaches the people that we've met in the communities or the people who've been on board or the people we've had a chance like you to speak with. And so there is a lot of focus now on legacy, and and part of that is there'll be a lot linked to education. So a lot of the video content, the stories, the messages that we've captured along the way are going to be put into early years, middle years, high school years, and teacher education programs that will be built around the four themes and that are curriculum linked. So you'll see over the next year a lot of uh, learning content that will come out from the messages from this. Uh, there's going to be a documentary that will capture it. There's going to be a couple books, a youth book, a children's book, as well as kind of a larger expedition book that will come out of it. And then, of course, yeah, this the science project, which is – actually has 27 projects within the C3 science program and all that research will go into not just knowledge mobilization in terms of, of science um, publications what have you but it'll also get packaged in a way it's accessible for schools and for the public in general and a lot of that focus is climate change biodiversity um, and just looking at kind of ocean wellness overall so there will be a lot of legacy. The other fun ones too is the musicians. There's been a musician on board each leg and they're, they've each written a song and they're going to be creating the Canada C3 music playlist or music album. There's been an artist on board each leg. They're curating a piece each and that'll be the Canada C3 art exhibit that will go across the country. And then there's also been a celebrity chef on board each leg. So they're together putting a, a cookbook that kind of celebrates local food and local food harvesting across the coastal regions of Canada. So lots of projects, but I, the one big one um, that we haven't mentioned yet is that there's a special room on the ship called the Legacy Room, and it's, it's in partnership with the Gord Downey Cheney Wenjack Fund, and many of you may have heard that Gord Downey recently passed away last week, and he's the lead singer of one of Canada's most famous bands, The Tragically Hip. And over the last year of his life, before he passed away, he focused a lot of his work around Indigenous people in Canada and to make sure that all Canadians really know the history of Canada and that we better understand it and take responsibility for it and to improve to ensure that Indigenous children across the country have the same opportunities and rights and support as non-Indigenous and so this legacy room as we've been going along the coast different uh, First Nation and Inuit Métis groups have been coming to the legacy room and sharing their stories and they've actually gifted things to the legacy room. So we have now over 60, 65 artifacts or gifts that have been given to the legacy room and each one tells a story and each one has a message for Canada. And so we're going to be putting that together into some kind of national interactive um, learning 
experience that will go to different communities across the country so that all Canadians get a chance to hear these stories and messages. So the next year is dedicated to the legacy work. Joe? All right. Well, it has been an epic journey and it's hard to believe it's already day 148. I know uh, you guys are going to have memories to last a lifetime. And, uh, you know, as a teacher myself, I can't thank you guys enough for being so, I guess, cognizant of education and uh, creating all these great resources and these hangouts. And I know there's been classrooms all across Canada who've had a blast hanging out with the C3. So thanks for everything you've done. Oh, thank you, Joe. And two last comments is when we arrive in Victoria on Saturday at 1130 Eastern time or Pacific time, 230 Eastern time, it, there'll be a live Facebook live happening. So if anyone wants to watch that happen, you can. Or on Monday, when you get back to class, you can go to the Canada C3 Facebook page and watch the video live that was taken that day. And you can see the ship coming in and the speeches and the musicians and what have you. So that might be fun. And last, Joe, just wanted to shout out to you and your organization, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Uh, you're one of 100 partners that have made this project possible and extended the reach of this project. And, and certainly, I think what you guys do with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, bringing science and adventure and exploration into the classrooms every day from remote and exciting places around the world is, is such a remarkable um, engagement tool to have for Canadian classrooms. So keep up the great work and it was an honor to work with you over the last 150 days. All right, right back at you. Thanks so much, Diz. Um, and classrooms, thank you so much for hanging out. I know a couple are starting to dug out, or duck out for lunches and recesses, but uh, before we sign off, I'm gonna turn all your microphones on so we can do an, one more big goodbye and thank you. But again, to both of you on the C3 and uh, yeah, enjoy the last couple of days and I look forward to catching the live stream on Saturday. Sounds great. Thank you everyone for joining us. Yep. Take care. Uh, all right, Michael. <laughs> all right, thank you everyone. We are signing off. <laughs>